Hoover used to go into, uh, well, one of the reasons, I want to say this is the, the, the direct, definite reason, but he used to frequent some places in Manhattan that were mob controlled. One of them was the Stork Club. I was told upon good information that he was there with his boyfriend at the time. The Stork Club at the time was bugged and wired because the owner of the Stork Club, a lot of celebrities would come in there. He would wire and bug these people and actually extort them or have information on them to either keep them coming to the club or whatever else he was doing. So he happened to catch uh, Hoover and his boyfriend on tape in the bathroom doing some stuff that they shouldn't have. And they held it over Hoover's head. And that was one incident that caused Hoover to never admit that there was a mafia. So they had what? photos and everything else. <laughs> they knew for sure. He would never admit to the existence of the mob. In 1889, Mendel and Yeshel Bronfman gathered their family and left Bessarabia, modern-day Moldova and Ukraine, for Canada, fleeing the anti-Semitic pogroms of Tsarist Russia. The two left behind a profitable tobacco farming business, but it would have been impossible for them to know that this decision would result in their family skyrocketing into the upper echelons of Western elites through a soon-to-be-built liquor empire. Following the family's immigration, accompanied by two servants and a personal rabbi, Yeshul realized the land of Manitoba was ill-suited for tobacco farming and was forced to find income through other means. Yeshul then worked on the Canadian railroads and in sawmills before moving into the sale of firewood and the trading of livestock and fish. But it would be the trading of horses that ultimately led the family into the hospitality sector and eventually the liquor business. The Bronfman's beginnings, particularly following their arrival in Canada, stand in such stark contrast to their current reputation that even Samuel Bronfman's sons, Edgar and Charles, were kept in the dark by their own father regarding the family business and Yeshul Bronfman's early days in Canada. A Bronfman biographer, former senior editor at The Economist, Nicholas Faith, would also write that underlying the family's riches was a deep sense of shame as to their origins, and that Sam's generation had shared an absolute refusal to tell their offspring anything about their life before their arrival in the Promised Land. Much of this secrecy could possibly be attributed to the desire by most immigrants to assimilate into their newfound homeland, Sam Bronfman being no exception to this desire, even going so far as to publicly claim he had been born in Brandon, Manitoba, Canada on March 4, 1891, as opposed to February 27, 1889, in Bessarabia. Michael Morris, one of the Bronfman's more sympathetic biographers, would write that Sam Bronfman never truly abandoned his enthusiastic identification with the country in which his career began, and his attempts to obfuscate his place of birth is perhaps the most significant indication of his obsession with the respectability he associated with Canadian citizenship. Patriotism aside, the Bronfman's alliances with unsavory characters and illicit business dealings could also play a heavy factor into Sam's unwillingness to discuss the origins of his family's wealth. At some point in the early 1890s, as he sampled spirits in a dingy saloon after selling off some horses, Yeshel Bronfman mulled the merits of leaving behind a life of hard labor in favor of the intertwined businesses of hospitality and liquor sales. Sam Bronfman would later claim that it was actually he who had convinced his father to move into hospitality and bartending, though most biographers doubt this, given Sam's age at the time. Regardless, it would be over a decade before the Bronfman family patriarch and his eldest sons managed to scrape together the funds necessary to realize Yeshul's dreams. However, by 1903, the Bronfman scraped and borrowed enough money to buy the Anglo-American Hotel in Emerson, Manitoba, Soon after, acquiring hotels in Yorkton, Saskatchewan, Winnipeg, and beyond, creating a small but profitable network prior to the onset of World War I. The dramatic shift in the family's fortune was largely thanks to the business acumen of Sam's brother Harry, who managed to stave off the financial damage and legal trouble caused by the gambling and other unseemly habits of their older brother Abe. Sam Bronfman formally joined the new family business in 1907 though he would later regale some of his biographers with the tales of how he had been the original dynamo behind the family's success in hospitality, despite considerable evidence to the contrary. What is notable, however, is the fact that not long after Sam formally became involved in hotel management, the family's hotels were targeted by a series of unfortunate accusations, including when they went to renew their liquor license in Yorktown in 1908. Locals had alleged that the Bronfmans were guilty of violating local liquor laws and condoning illegal gambling in their inns. The latter is particularly likely, given the well-known gambling habits of A. Bronfman. 
which were known to have threatened the family business on more than one occasion, coinciding with Sam's formal involvement in 1907, was the emergence of the Social and Moral Reform Council, an organization that would ultimately bring prohibition to Canada, comprised of the leadership of various Protestant churches, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the Royal Templars of Temperance, and various other like-minded groups, the Council embodied the social gospel Protestant movement of the period that sought to fight social evils, including those that caused rapid urbanization and industrialization. This fight naturally led liquor to becoming a target of their ambitions. The Council and its allies appealed to the religious and non-religious Canadians, as bars and saloons were disliked at the time for reasons beyond moral depravity, namely their stench and the fact that roughly a third of prosecution at the time related to drunkenness. While the temperance movement divided the Canadian population, it garnered enough support to become common policy at the onset of World War I. Prior to this, prohibition was purely a provincial matter. However, once the tides of war washed over Canada, Many believed that banning the manufacture, distribution, and sale of alcohol would aid in the war effort. As a result, many provinces chose to enact prohibition, even before the short-lived federal ban of 1918. The impact of prohibition on Canada's liquor industry was substantial and felt long after it was repealed, with 75% of its breweries having closed by 1928. However, prohibition was conveniently fortuitous for some, the Bronfman's chief among them. Given the provincial nature of prohibition in Canada prior to its brief stint as a federal policy, the differences between the temperance laws of various provinces provided numerous loopholes that the Bronfmans were able to exploit to great effect. So successful were the Bronfmans at aptly working in the gray area of the varied and often temporary gaps between provincial laws that author Peter Newman remarked in his biography of the Bronfmans, Bronfman dynasty, the Rothschilds of the New World, sometimes it almost seemed that the American Congress and the Canadian federal and provincial legislatures must have secretly held a grand conclave to decide one issue, how they could draft anti-liquor laws and regulations that would help maximize the Bronfman brothers' bootlegging profits. One example of this, during World War I, the three eldest Bronfman brothers, Abe, Harry, and Sam, exploited the fact that Manitoba and Ontario, while prohibiting the sale of liquor within the province, allowed alcohol to be imported. The brothers set up several mail-order liquor businesses throughout the two provinces and profited handsomely. That is, until the ban on interprovincial trading would go into effect in 1918 with the federal prohibition. Though federal prohibition also came with a loophole, which allowed alcohol to be sold for medicinal purposes. This prompted Harry Bronfman to create a wholesale drug company that permitted him to import alcohol in bulk and provide it to area pharmacies. He placed its office next door to one of the family's ritzier hotels, the Balmoral, and its business model involved offering doctors a bonus for each liquor prescription they wrote if that prescription was fulfilled by a pharmacy whose liquor was furnished by the Bronfmans. Reading from Canadian historian Stephen Schneider's Iced, The Story of Organized Crime in Canada, by capitalizing on Canada's poorest temperance laws, the brothers not only made their first fortune, they also established a pattern of wily decisions that would characterize their Prohibition-era liquor operations. The enactment of national prohibition in Canada in 1918 virtually wiped out the Bronfman's mail-order liquor business. But true to form, Sam and Harry took advantage of another loophole in provincial prohibition legislation. They realized that Saskatchewan still allowed the sale of liquor for medicinal purposes. With this in mind, Harry obtained a license to establish a wholesale drug company, and in 1919, with a newly acquired provincial license in hand, he founded the Canada Pure Drug Company in Yorkton, which Bronfman biographer Michael Morris called a thinly disguised liquor outlet that soon pumped more whiskey into retail drug stores than any other wholesaler in Saskatchewan. This new business venture was another crucial turning point for the career of the Bronfman brothers. No longer were they simply taking advantage of legal loopholes. They were now breaking the law, in addition to importing and legally supplying medicinal alcohol to doctors and pharmacies in that province. The same liquor would be flavored, bottled, and then labeled for the underground market in Canada and the U.S. In their investigation of the Bronfman's, one of the Royal Commission's conclusions was that the Canada Pure Drug Company was never engaged in the drug business, but confined its activities to the sale of alcohol in western provinces and to purchasers from the United States. The commission documented evidence that the company imported from the United States about 300,000 gallons of alcohol, brought it to Yorkton, and had it compounded and bottled. The company then labeled the compound as Scotch Whiskey. Out of the Bronfman brothers, 
It had been Sam who was sent to travel across Canada and the United States, which allowed him to build a vast network that included numerous American and Canadian distilleries and bootleggers. This network would, in a few years, prove essential to the Bronfmans, especially Sam, once Prohibition arrived in Canada's southern neighbor, the United States. Beyond the complicity of corrupt officials and doctors, a driving force behind the Bronfman family's Prohibition-era success was their ties forged by Sam to the Hudson's Bay Company, long a dominant force in Canada's economy, backed by the political and economic elite of England since its founding in the 1600s. Reading from Nicholas Faith, The Bronfmans, The Rise and Fall of the House of Seagram, Sam was supported by the giant Hudson's Bay Company, which dominated the liquor business in Canada. They trusted him implicitly after he had refused to make any profit on a couple of thousand cases of whiskey that the Hudson's Bay wanted to buy back from him. To a considerable degree, Mr. Sam modeled his activities on the Hudson's Bay Mail Order Company, which had been the first in the field in 1916. His price list matched theirs, as did the quality of the brands he advertised. It was virtually risk-free, for the goods were paid for in advance, and the initiative enabled the family to run a continent-wide business for the first time. However, in the cutthroat and often extremely violent world of bootlegging in Canada, implicit trust was unlikely to have been granted from just a single act. More likely was the fact that Hudson's Bay Company had long been the dominant force in Canada's liquor industry and had every intention of continuing to operate its liquor business during Prohibition. The Bronfmans were sure to have caught their attention early on, not just through their mail order business, but because Harry Bronfman had quickly gained a reputation as the king of bootleggers who was able to easily skirt the law due to his contacts with corrupt local and provincial officials. Sam had also sought to focus the entire family business on liquor early on in Prohibition, which would have made him a critical contact for any business seeking to clandestinely deal with the Bronfman's sell of spirits during this period. Hudson's Bay liquor imports during Prohibition also greatly benefited the business of British and Scottish distillers. Many of these British distillers also boasted ties to the royal family and England's political elite. These companies risked losing a considerable amount of income if their ability to export spirits to Canada had been entirely cut off, especially at a time when drinking in England was on the wane. The British government itself was clearly aware of these concerns and made the promotion of exports, liquor in particular, a key policy aimed at offsetting the country's considerable war debts. Direct ties between Hudson's Bay Company and bootlegging soon emerged with the trial of Walter Finley. Walter Finley made his name as a crusader against the evils of alcohol. Rising to prominence as a mentor of the People's Prohibition Association, he was an obvious choice for the newly created Office of Prohibition Commissioner when liquor consumption was declared illegal in British Columbia in 1917. So it came as no small surprise to British Columbians when in December 1918, less than a year into his tenure, Finley was arrested for the sale and import of liquor, some confiscated, some rerouted from other destinations, and some simply stolen from government storehouses. The Vancouver province wrote, Finley, ex-Prohibition Commissioner, is being sought on a warrant charging him with breach of trust in the performance of his duties as a public official. The maximum penalty on conviction is five years imprisonment in the penitentiary. As in most American states, Prohibition, which only lasted from 1917 to 1920, was an utter failure in British Columbia. In addition to the roaring bootleg trade, BC doctors were also permitted to write prescriptions for medicinal liquor, prescriptions which netted the government more than $1.5 million in 1919 alone. Despite Finley's refusal to talk during his trial, the packed courtroom heard startling testimony from a number of witnesses alleging the existence of a citywide storage and distribution network, even pointing to a liquor delivery service run by the Hudson's Bay Company. Whatever the true story is behind these ties, the alliance between Sam Brofman, the Hudson's Bay Company, and the prominent distillers of England and Scotland would be crucial to the success of all parties during and after Prohibition. Following the conclusion of Canadian Prohibition, America began its own crusade against alcohol in January 1920. Sam Brofman would be quick to seize this as an opportunity to get a foothold in the distilling business. Reading from Daniel Okrant, Last Call, The Rise and Fall of Prohibition, in the very beginning of the Bronfman's cross-border business, the liquor flowed upstream as American distillers disposed of much of their presumably valueless inventory by sending it to Canada. In the first year of U.S. Prohibition, the Bronfman's imported some 300,000 gallons of whiskey from American distilleries, mixed it with raw alcohol and water, and began shipping a much larger quantity of seriously degraded product back across the border. 
When their supply of Old Crow and Sunnybrook and other American brands ran out, the Bronfmans began importing enormous quantities of pure neutral spirits from Scotland, diluting it and adding appropriate coloring. Caramel was a favorite. Some other blenders used prune juice for color and creosote to add a smoky flavor. Before the end of the year, they were sending 26,600 cases, almost 64,000 gallons of their goods back to the United States each month. The Brofman product was mixed, bottled, and stored in a series of export houses in local idiom, boozoriums, strung along the Saskatchewan border with North Dakota. The Bowman Brothers Printing Company of Winnipeg provided labels. Anybody could walk in and buy 1,000 or 5,000 labels anytime they wanted to, and soon case upon case of bottles bearing either counterfeit brands or invented ones would emerge from the boozoriums, all dressed up for the 18-mile trip from Estevan, Saskatchewan to Noonan, North Dakota. Among the Bronfman's faux scotches were unimaginative but likely brands such as Old Highland and Prince of Wales, as well as inventive, if improbable, ones like Glen Levy. As stock from American distilleries began to run out in 1923, the Bronfmans built a distillery near Montreal. They named their newest venture Distillers Corporation Limited, the same name as the then unrelated and significantly more prestigious Scottish company that included the top five whiskey and gin producers in the British Isles. The name the Bronfmans had chosen was no coincidence as the audacious name Sam had chosen for the family's first distillery succeeded in attracting the near immediate attention of the Scottish firm. Subsequently, the Bronfman family formed a joint venture with the elite of Scotland and England's liquor industry, thereby uniting the two companies that shared the name Distillers Corporation Limited. Their union also allowed the Bronfmans to secure the exclusive right to import many of their top brands from across the pond. Roughly a decade later, in the 1930s, Sam Bronfman purchased and built a number of distilleries in Scotland, further deepening his ties to the liquor barons of the old world. The ability of the Bronfmans to secure this deal at the time likely owed to Sam's pre-existing ties to the Hudson's Bay Company, which had previously imported many of the brands united under British Distillers Company Limited. Another potential factor was the chance meeting between one of the Bronfmans' middlemen, Louis Rosensteel, and Winston Churchill in 1922. A year later, Bronfman traveled to Kentucky, where Rosenthal was based at the time, and purchased an Elling distillery, the components of which were then shipped north and used to create the Bronfman's first distillery. Winston Churchill himself had family ties to the Hudson's Bay Company. One of his ancestors held governorship in the company in the late 1680s and 1690s. Churchill was also in charge of Britain's colonial office from 1919 to 1922. In this capacity, he refused to use British authority or influence to interfere with the liquor businesses of any British colonies. This included the British-dominated Rum Row, a term referring to the line of ships carrying liquor that would anchor just outside of the maritime limit of America's authority, a place where the Bronfman family was also active. Reading again from Last Call, Churchill, in the colonial office made no concessions at all. Winston Churchill believed that a state is only responsible for the enforcement of its own laws and had no obligation to implement the laws of another nation. He flatly refused to use British influence, authority, or power to interfere in any way with the liquor trade of the Bahamas or any other British colony in the Caribbean. Several years later, summing up his view of the 18th Amendment, Churchill landed on a phrase that went beyond any sputtering invocation of Puritanism. Prohibition, Churchill said, was an affront to the whole history of mankind. Churchill would later emerge as a key investor in America's post-war liquor industry, an industry where Sam Bronfman and Louis Rosenstiel would quickly become major players. In March 1934, Churchill was able to invest $5,850, equivalent to roughly $130,000 today, in National Distillers Products Corporation, the same American company that awarded its New England franchise to Joe Kennedy. Later that year, Churchill managed to buy some more of the same stock for $4,374, equivalent to roughly $97,000 today. The Bronfman family's liquor clout would continue to grow following Prohibition. Sam Bronfman would even manage to personally meet Queen Elizabeth II of England in 1939. He would then go on to create the popular Canadian whiskey, Crown Royal, to commemorate her visit. 
Returning to the 1920s, five years after the Bronfman's initial successful venture with Distillers Company Limited, in 1928, the Bronfman's merged their business with Joseph E. Seagram & Sons of Waterloo, Ontario. They called their new partnership Distillers Corporation Seagram's Limited. Sam anticipated the end of Prohibition, and he decided to expand and upgrade their Waterloo and LaSalle distilleries in anticipation of what he foresaw as increased demand. The merged company became Seagram Company Limited, or Seagram's, and would serve as the Bronfman family's financial vehicle, not just for their ever-expanding liquor empire, but for their subsequent interest in chemicals, oil, and entertainment. Much of the Bronfman's early involvement in bootlegging took place across the Saskatchewan, North Dakota border in Boozoriums, where their liquor could be purchased in Canada and then moved to their final destination in the United States. But the murder of a Bronfman brother-in-law turned associate and the promise of more lucrative markets for Bronfman booze soon drew their attention elsewhere. Sam would later state, We were late starters in the two most lucrative markets, on the high seas and across the Detroit River. What came out of the border trade in Saskatchewan was insignificant by comparison. This was when we started to make our real money. The bootlegging operation of the Bronfmans would later extend far beyond the Canadian U.S. border, with the family establishing warehouses and fronts throughout the Caribbean and Mexico. They were encircling their main market, the United States. Of course, with great profit came great risk, and though they avoided major legal trouble for their ties to bootlegging operations during American Prohibition, it caught up with them soon after. In 1934, the Bronfman brothers were charged with conspiracy to violate the statutes of a friendly country and for evading taxes on liquor they had exported out of Canada. Soon after the charges were announced, Sam Bronfman allegedly ordered the destruction of thousands of documents aimed at shielding their early operation from inquisitorial eyes, and Bronfman-owned companies tied to smuggling and their assets would mysteriously vanish. As a result, the case against the Bronfmans ran into an insurmountable roadblock, and the four Bronfman brothers were acquitted on all charges by the summer of 1935. They even managed to settle with U.S. authorities, negotiating a $3 million settlement with the Treasury Department, a mere fraction of what they had gained during American Prohibition. Sam Bronfman's rise as a global liquor baron also depended, in no insignificant way, to his connections with organized crime, often through the use of middlemen. Among his North American connections, our old National Crime Syndicate friends, Charles Lucky Luciano, Abner Longies Willman, and Meyer Lansky, as well as members of Detroit's Purple Gang and others. During the U.S. Senate Kofaver Committee hearings in the 1950s, many American mafiosi would name Bronfman as a central figure in their bootlegging operations. Though Sam Bronfman was careful to distance himself from organized crime, it is alleged he had a somewhat cozier relationship with Meyer Lansky. Reading from Iced, the Bronfmans and their agents dealt with some of North America's most notorious rum runners, bootleggers, and gangsters, including Ontario's Rocco Puri, Meyer Chechik, and Harry Rabinovich of Saskatchewan, Frank Costello, and Meyer Lansky of New York, Cleveland's Mo Dallitz, the Purple Gang from Detroit, the Rhinefield Syndicate of New Jersey, and Charlie Solomon, a major player in the Boston underworld. Even competitors such as Louis Rosensteel, who later ran the giant Shenley Distillers Company in the U.S., got his start during Prohibition by purchasing booze from the Bronfmans. Some have alleged that Sam Bronfman flew to New York to solicit business from U.S. bootleggers and personally wooed Meyer Lansky over fancy dinners. In turn, Lansky reportedly arranged for Bronfman to attend a Jack Dempsey fight in New York in 1923. Whether Bronfman and Lansky ever met is uncertain, but in his old age, Lansky, a principal architect of modern organized crime in America, would bitterly ask, why is Lansky a gangster and not the Bronfman and Rosenthal families, although they do not like to talk about it and change the subject when my name is mentioned? During a special U.S. Senate committee hearing into organized crime held in 1951, Frank Costello, a New York mobster so powerful and influential that he was referred to as the Prime Minister of the Underworld, was confronted over his reputed ties to Sam Bronfman. Although he first denied ever personally buying liquor from the Bronfmans, after repeated questioning, Costello nervously provided this rambling and confused admission. What I meant is, if I bought liquor from him, that means I met him in the United States and bought it from him in the United States. I come to the conclusion that I never bought it from him in Canada. I bought it in New York, either from Bronfman or independent people. I want to make it specifically on the record 
that I bought it in New York, whether it was Bronfman or anyone else. And if Bronfman shipped it to anyone else, I bought it from someone else. Through its own investigative work, the committee may have very well unearthed the identity of that someone else. Committee members confronted Costello with testimony he made before the New York State Liquor Authority in 1947, in which he stated that one Harry Saucer was the person from whom he arranged the importation of liquor from Canada. These ties between organized crime and the Bronfmans could serve as an explanation as to why past efforts to chronicle the rise of the Bronfmans were ill-fated endeavors. Peter Dell Scott, in his book, Kings of the Castle, The Making of a Dynasty, Seagrams, and the Bronfman Empire, alleges that the first person to attempt to chronicle the Bronfmans, Terence Robertson, had traveled to New York to investigate Bronfman and the sprawling corporate empire of Seagrams. While in New York, he had allegedly concluded the book, but had telephoned a journalist colleague back in Canada, distraught. In that phone call, Robertson claimed to have found out things about Sam they didn't want me to write about. Robertson would then allegedly call a second colleague, stressing that his life had been threatened and we would know who was doing the threatening, but that he would do the job himself. After receiving the frantic call and fearing that Robertson's life was in danger, the second journalist called the New York police, who quickly responded, only to find Robertson dying of barbiturate poisoning to which he succumbed. Robertson's lengthy interviews with the Bronfmans were never published, but still exist in manuscript form. While I couldn't find confirmation of these testimonies, I was able to find articles verifying that Terence Robertson did exist through newspaper articles and a court appeal regarding the life insurance payout of Robertson's death. It should also be noted that this took place in New York City, a major seat of power for the National Crime Syndicate, who as we've seen clearly had ties to the Bronfman family. Subsequent attempts to author a biography of Sam Bronfman and his family's rise to prominence also failed to make it to publication, such as the efforts made by former editor of the Canadian edition of Time magazine, John Scott, and another made by Canadian journalist Erna Paris. However, some books of the Bronfman family did emerge once Sam had reached old age, such as an account of the family by Peter Newman and a novel by Mordecai Rickler, believed to have been inspired by the Bronfmans. According to Nicholas Faith, the Bronfmans apparently did not take kindly to their portrayal by either Newman or Rickler, both of whom were Jewish, prompting the family behind the Seagrams to allege that both authors were anti-Semitic Jews. The Bronfman clan has always been sensitive to critical reports. Given their long-standing efforts to develop their reputation as elite philanthropists are marred by the evidence of the symbiotic relationship between the family business and organized crime. Expanding on this relationship, Personal ties aside, the Bronfman enterprise relied heavily on the use of middlemen, two particularly essential middlemen being Joseph Reinfeld and Louis Lou Rosenstiel. Reinfeld served as a close advisor to Sam Bronfman, as well as an important business associate as he was the principal purchaser of Seagram's whiskey. It was also Reinfeld who convinced Sam to build up inventory prior to and during Prohibition, which would help Sam Bronfman secure a significant portion of the post-Prohibition liquor market. Lou also managed much of the in-person dealings with crime-linked individuals on Sam Bronfman's behalf, which was key to Sam's winning strategy to mitigate legal risk and prevent further damage to his social reputation. The end result saw Reinfeld buy large amounts of Seagram's liquor, mainly at Rum Row, while ensuring that the Bronfmans did not have to directly deal with their final crime-linked customers. However, in at least one instance, Reinfeld actually brought Sam Bronfman and his family business into close contact with a notorious mobster. This occurred when Reinfeld sent Longies Willman to negotiate directly with Sam Bronfman. According to Nicholas Faith, Sam certainly knew Abner Longies Willman, a youngster famous for his friendships with Meyer Lansky and Lucky Luciano. In 1935, Zwillman was awarded the honor of being named public enemy number one by the FBI. Sam, aware of his own lack of physical presence, was naturally impressed by the presentable, well-manicured Longy Zwillman. According to one witness, Sam kept repeating how well-behaved Longy is, how studious looking. You'd never guess he was a starker. Also, he has a head on his shoulders. Reinfeld's operation during Prohibition was massive, and massively profitable for the Bronfmans. Reading from Eist, Reinfeld, a naturalized American citizen from Poland who presided over a massive New Jersey-based bootlegging organization, which, according to the U.S. Senate investigation, imported nearly 40% of all the illicit alcohol consumed in the United States during Prohibition. 
U.S. Treasury investigators stated before the committee that they had uncovered bank deposits made by the syndicate of around $25 million and estimated that the Rhinefield Syndicate collected approximately $60 million from their illegal liquor distributorships. A letter dated October 21, 1929 marked secret from the Canadian legation in Washington to the Secretary of State for External Affairs in Ottawa described the Rhinefeld Syndicate as a highly organized smuggling ring operating on a very large scale, maintaining its own fleet of ocean-going vessels as contact ships, a radio station to direct operations, and houses along the coast, which the newspapers call well-supplied armories. Based largely on the testimony of retired U.S. Treasury agents, the Senate committee accused the Bronfman family of being the primary source of liquor for the Rheinfeld Syndicate, going so far as to declare that during Prohibition, this group of notorious bootleggers were partners in some of Bronfman's operations. The committee also alleged that the Rheinfeld Syndicate was laundering its profits through Canada. This syndicate, dealing largely with the Bronfman interest which owned the Bronfman Distillery of Canada, carried on what they described as the high seas operation. This system under which they operated consisted of bringing liquor from Canada, France, England, Scotland, and Germany to the little St. Lawrence River island of St. Pierre at Miquelon and there transshipping it to the Rum Runway, 12 miles off Sandy Hook. At that point, the syndicate's customers took over and ran the liquor into the United States. Much of the money received would be sent in the $100,000 and $500,000 lots, frequently in gold, to Canada so that in case this country got too hot for them, they would have something if they had to flee. At the height of its operations, the Rhinefield Syndicate was reportedly purchasing 22,000 cases a month from the Bronfman companies. Historian Stephen Fox also contends that tanker ships owned or leased by Rheinfeld would travel to the Bronfman Dockside Warehouse in Montreal or St. Pierre, where the booze was pumped directly into large copper-lined tanks in the ship's hull. It would then set sail to the New Jersey coast, where it would anchor 100 yards offshore. A small boat would bring out a hose lined with linen, and 25,000 gallons of Canadian whiskey would be pumped into oaken tanks onshore. The close association between Bronfman and Rheinfeld would later come back to haunt them both particularly when Reinfeld's longtime bodyguard, James Rutkin, testified in front of the Kefauver Committee in the early 1950s. Rutkin would tell all regarding the early days of the Bronfman family business, including the relationships of both Bronfman and Reinfeld with mobsters like Zwillman and Lansky. Some Bronfman family biographers, such as Nicholas Faith, have alleged that Rutkin sought to use his testimony in a failed attempt to blackmail the Bronfmans, threatening to reveal more if he was left uncompensated. Among Rutkin's claims regarding the Brothmans, several pertain to the family's hotel business in Canada that had preceded their liquor empire. Rutkin, describing the Brothmans as four brothers from Montreal, teased the Kefauver Committee, stating first that if you want to find out more about the Brothman-owned hotels, you can ask the Canadian Mounted Police, and they will tell you about the little hotels, and you can use your imagination. He later added that these hotels serviced people who slept very fast and that the same room would be rented quite a few times during the night, implying that the hotels were in fact brothels. Several Bronfman biographers also mentioned these accusations, which had dogged the family since their earliest days in the hotel business. Some believe that Sam Bronfman tacitly confirmed that this was the case many years after Ruckin first made these claims, when, according to Morris, Sam remarked, if there were brothels, they were the best in the West. Nevertheless, the Bronfmans allege that Ruckin's claims were entirely absurd. But despite their best efforts, Ruckin's testimony received considerable publicity, creating a whirlwind of rumors that refused to be snuffed out. That is, until Ruckin turned up dead in 1956, having allegedly slit his own throat with a borrowed razor while in the custody of New Jersey's Hudson County Jail. Louis Rosenstiel, the second prominent Bronfman middleman who had deep ties to organized crime as well as FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, saw his relationship with the liquor baron and Seagram chair take an entirely different trajectory than that of Sam and Joseph Reinfeld. Of the books and writings that touch on Rosenstiel's history and demeanor, few are favorable. A 1959 piece in Esquire describes Rosenstiel as intelligent, articulate, and extraordinarily aggressive, adding that he often slopes in his chair, plays with his tongue as he speaks, 
and utters his strong opinions with a growl, expressing dislike and contempt for anyone who might disagree. Others, such as Nicholas Faith, describe Rosenstiel as loud, opinionated, and domineering, a hulking figure who favored amber-tinted glasses, which he rarely removed, and large cigars to go with his status as one of the wealthiest men alive. The New York Times obituary for Rosenstiel uses similar terms, referring to the liquor baron, known to many simply as the chairman, as having been a domineering man with a quick temper. Official accounts of Rosenstiel's past and how he built his company, Shenley, into a corporate behemoth seem oddly sanitized, not entirely unlike the official accounts of the Bronfen family's early history during Prohibition. Born in 1891 in Cincinnati, Ohio, Rosenstiel, thanks to an unfortunate injury during a football match in his teenage years, dropped out of high school and went to work for his uncle at the Susquehmack Distilling Company in Milton, Kentucky in 1907. Rosen still would see his fortune shift dramatically from those humble beginnings during the era of American Prohibition. Though little is known of his life during this period, aside from him allegedly leaving the tedious tasks of his uncle's distillery to become a whiskey broker. According to official accounts, with his line of work and the distilling and sale of spirits drying up during Prohibition, Rosen still turned to selling shoes and bonds somehow managing to accumulate enough money to afford a vacation to the French Riviera in 1922. It was during this vacation that he would be lucky enough to score a chance meeting with Winston Churchill. Per the New York Times, Churchill advised Rosenstiel to prepare for the return of liquor sales in the United States. There is little, if any, context given in official accounts as to how or why a high school dropout turned distillery worker and shoe salesman would have attracted the attention of a notorious elitist and member of the British aristocracy like Churchill. As the story goes, Rosen still spent the next 10 years of his life dutifully following Churchill's advice. Rosen still would somehow convince Lehman Brothers, one of the most powerful banks on Wall Street, to offer him a massive loan to finance his acquisition of closed distilleries and aged whiskey inventories for the yet to materialize date of repeal. Again, no explanation is offered as to how an elite banking institution such as Lehman Brothers would grant someone with Rosenstiel's background such a large amount of capital based merely on advice he had received from a British politician, suggesting there might be more to the story. We're then told that Rosenthal incorporated Shenley Distillers Company in the wake of repeal in 1933. He was conveniently well-placed to become the most powerful figure in the distilled spirits business, all thanks to him having heeded Churchill's advice and thanks to a remarkable patience that he was never known to have possessed during any other point in his life. Indeed, impatience, rather than patience, was one of Rosenstiel's most well-known traits, with his characterization by media as a domineering man with a quick temper being one of many examples. Of course, as should be clear, this narrative conveniently obfuscates any hint of illegality in Rosenstiel's prohibition-era dealings, and more importantly, fails to mention Rosenstiel's documented ties to organized crime figures or his role as a prominent purchaser of Bronfman liquor alongside Joseph Reinfeld, and other Seagram's middlemen. Reading from a New York Times article by Nicholas Gage, a congressional investigator testified yesterday that Louis Rosenstiel, the former chairman of Shenley Industries, was part of a consortium with underworld figures that bought liquor in Canada during Prohibition and sold it illegally in the United States. The witness, James P. Kelly, chief investigator for the Interstate and Foreign Commerce Committee of the House of Representatives, said the consortium bought the liquor from Samuel Bronfman, the founder of Seagram Distillers. Kelly, who appeared as a witness before the State Joint Legislative Committee on Crime, said the other men in the consortium were Meyer Lansky, the reputed organized crime leader, Joseph Fusco, an associate of Al Capone, and Joseph Lindsay, a Boston man Kelly identified as a convicted bootlegger. Kelly said in his testimony that the liquor that was smuggled from Canada by the consortium was sold throughout the United States. Lindsay handled distribution in New England and Fusco concentrated on the Chicago area. Following Prohibition, Rosen still developed Shenley Industries into one of the major distilleries in the country, and Lindsay and Fusco set up companies in Boston and Chicago respectively in order to distribute Shenley products. Lindsay was said to have extensive business interests in Boston and also associates in the underworld hierarchy, including Raymond Patriarca, 
the reputed boss of the Mafia in New England, and Meyer Lansky. An investigator for the Joint Legislative Committee on Crime said that in future hearings, the committee, whose chairman is Senator John H. Hughes, would establish clear links between Rosenstiel and underworld figures, particularly Meyer Lansky, who was now living in Israel. Extrapolating further on these ties to organized crime, reading from Anthony Summers, Official and Confidential, The Secret Life of J. Edgar Hoover, Rosenstiel's lifelong involvement with the Mafia came to light only in 1970, when the New York State Legislative Committee on Crime established that he and mob characters had formed a consortium to smuggle liquor during Prohibition. When Prohibition ended, committee investigators learned Rosenstiel had appeared at a business meeting flanked by Frank Costello. According to a witness, Costello was there to give them a message that Rosenstiel was one of their people. You know, if there was any problem, they would see to it. Rosenstiel also had long-standing links to Meyer Lansky. He and the gangster owned points together in mob-operated businesses, including a Las Vegas casino. During the committee's investigations, Rosenstiel was also observed playing host to Angelo Bruno, the Philadelphia Mafia boss. Many of these leads were supplied to the committee by Rosenstiel's fourth wife, Susan Kaufman. At 52, she was emerging from a decade in the divorce courts, during which Rosenstiel had spent nearly half a million dollars attempting to concoct phony evidence against her. Embittered though she was, Crime Committee Chairman John Hughes had no doubts about her testimony. His chief counsel, Edward McLaughlin, now a New York judge, remembers her as an excellent witness. I thought her to be absolutely truthful, he said. The woman's power of recall was phenomenal. Everything she said was checked and double-checked, and everything that was checkable turned out to be true. Most of Susan's testimony to the committee was behind closed doors, in executive session, and remains sealed to this day. However, two decades later, interviewed at her home in France, she still had the keen recall that so impressed the New York investigators. By her account, to live with Rosenstiel was to live with the command structure of organized crime. Her first day with Rosenstiel in 1955 was dinner at the Waldorf, accompanied by Lansky associate Joe Lindsay. Lindsay was there again during their honeymoon cruise, along with Robert Gould, a shelling distributor who had been jailed for black marketeering during World War II. Susan would later meet Sam Giancana, the Chicago Mafia boss, and Santos Traficante, the Florida crime chieftain. She was also introduced to Al Hart and Art Samish, both shady operators in the liquor business. During 1957, a time of crisis for the mob, the year of the Appalachian Conference and feuding over who was to dominate New York, Rosen still stayed in constant touch with Frank Costello. He visited him during a brief spell in jail, then received him as a guest at his home on East 80th Street. Earlier this same year, on a trip to Cuba, Rosenstiel had introduced Susan to Meyer Lansky, an experience she described vividly to the New York Crime Committee. We arrived in Havana, Susan testified, and then we went to the National Hotel. We had a very big suite, and it was filled with flowers. I looked at the card, and it said, Welcome Supreme Commander, to Havana, Meyer and Jake. Susan would ask Rosenstiel who Meyer and Jake were, to which he would reply, That's Meyer and Jake Lansky, very good friends. The Rosenstills dined with Meyer Lansky that evening. He paid for all of their bills in Havana and provided unlimited credit for gambling. Rosenstill, for his part, would regularly return the hospitality whenever the mobster found himself in New York or Florida. Susan was also aware that her husband had business dealings with Lansky. He was always having under-the-table transactions, and for that, he didn't want to use the banks, just cash, and Lansky used to put up a lot of money. Once, according to Susan, they gave Rosenstiel some kind of big payment at the Sands Casino in Las Vegas. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in bundles of cash. Rosenstiel also maintained strong relationships with men of political power, two of the most prominent being FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover and New York lawyer and prosecutor Roy Cohn. Contrary to denials by Hoover's two propaganda chiefs, Lou Nichols and Cartha DeLuch, Rosenstiel was a close friend of Hoover. They knew each other very well, said Sidney Stricker, the son of Rosenstiel's longtime attorney who himself worked for Shenley. Jesse Weiss, a restaurant owner in Miami Beach, confirmed their relationship as well. Rosenstiel and Hoover were social friends. They came to my place together whenever they were in Miami. It's also said that Hoover sometimes flew with Rosenstiel in his private plane. Recently released FBI documents show that Hoover was aware of Rosenstiel 
and extended bureau assistance to him as early as 1933. Meyer Lansky would also use Rosenstiel as a go-between while plotting the surrender of gangster Louis Lepke Buchalter to Hoover and the FBI in 1939. In 1946, Hoover and his compatriot Clyde Tolson were guests of honor at a barbecue thrown by leading liquor companies. Rosenstiel is included. By the 50s, Rosenstiel was surrounded by familiar figures from J. Edgar Hoover's world, one of whom being George Sikalski the Hearst columnist who churned out right-wing propaganda, much of it gleaned from daily calls to the FBI. Sikalski had long since acted as a mouthpiece for Hoover, and now, in return for regular handouts, he also parroted Rosenstiel's views. Closest of all was Roy Cohn, now a high-profile New York attorney. His services were at the disposal of Louis Rosenstiel, though he had little to no genuine affection for the man. Cohn would be disbarred 20 years later in part for helping Rosenstiel sign a document naming Cohn as his trustee and executor. This was done at a time when Rosenstiel was senile and in a terminal coma. Rosenstiel, for his part, trusted Cohn as a son, and Cohn indulged his eccentricities. The pair was once observed on a yacht cruising past the West Point Military Academy with a recording of General MacArthur's farewell speech blaring forth from a loudspeaker. The Rosenstiel clique also liked to address one another as if they were part of some sort of secret army, with Cohn, as well as Meyer Lansky, referring to Rosenstiel as Supreme Commander. Following Prohibition, Rosenstiel's transition from bootlegger to businessman also very nearly included a direct partnership with Sam Bronfman. In 1929, as the end of Prohibition neared, Bronfman invested $585,000 in a Rosenstiel-owned distillery and also acquired a 20% stake in Rosenstiel's company. However, Sam would claim, probably correctly, that he was deterred once and for all from going into partnership with Rosenstiel when he visited the Shenley Distillery. I told him from the outside, his distillery was a piece of junk, and that on the inside, it was even worse. The final breaking point came when Sam saw that Lou was selling whiskey hot off the still, meaning immediately after it was distilled and not aged in accordance with Sam's lifelong credo. From then on, Rosenstiel and the low standards he stood for made him Sam's number one enemy. According to Faith, the falling out with Rosenstiel, whatever the cause, took a tremendous emotional toll on the two men. Soon after, Sam Brofman would come down with a severe flu. During this time, Rosenstiel arrived at the hotel room where he was being treated, potentially in an attempt to salvage their partnership. It's alleged that Rosenstiel all but wept as he begged for just a moment with his friend. Though, despite being gravely ill, Sam Bronfman told Rosenstiel they have nothing to discuss, ending any hopes of a future partnership. Their feud would subsequently escalate to such an extent that it would transcend business competition, with a 1959 article in Esquire noting either man appears willing to sacrifice profits to do the other in the eye. Rosenstiel was also known to refer to Bronfman in his business as unscrupulous alien competition, with alien in this instance meaning Canadian. Bronfman, for his part, was known to become angry rather quickly whenever Rosenstiel's name or business came up, saying he had no admiration for the man and would frequently refer to him as Rosenschlemil, with Schlemil meaning something along the lines of simpleton or born loser in Yiddish. It's also alleged that Bronfman's secret building in New York City had been planned out to make Rosenstiel's offices in the Empire State Building look just a little shabby compared to their luxury. Though both men had legendary tempers and a legendary feud to match, Bronfman and Rosenstiel had major differences in character, particularly in how they managed their respective businesses and in their personal lives. One of these major differences being that Rosenstiel harbored a deep obsession with blackmail. As cited by Nicholas Faith, Rosenstiel even went so far as to having placed bugging devices throughout his offices. He would then go on to treat his employees like dirt, sacking them at a moment's notice, then go to the toilet to leave them time to compromise themselves by talking in his absence. Additionally, several sources told the New York Crime Committee that Rosenstiel had his Manhattan home wired from roof to basement with hidden microphones so that he could spy on visitors and staff. The man who installed the system, security consultant Fred Otash, said it was rigged to tape conversations for hours on end. Otash had gained infamy as a private detective who used electronic means to spy on the Kennedy family, Marilyn Monroe, and others. 
He also harbored a penchant for blackmail himself, particularly sexual blackmail. He had once attempted to entrap John F. Kennedy using a call girl named Sue Young in the lead up to the 1960 presidential election. Rosenstiel was also involved in a broader effort to obtain this variety of blackmail, which may explain why he had sought out the California-based Otash to bug his New York home. It's also possible that Rosenstiel's interest in this variety of blackmail stemmed from his own private life and sexual proclivities, as well as the sexual proclivities of many of his associates. Proclivities that could offer immensely powerful blackmail opportunities should evidence of these activities be held in the right hands. Pulling from the 1992 Frontline PBS documentary, The Secret File of J. Edgar Hoover. In the late 1950s, Hoover was a regular visitor at the home of Meyer Lansky's friend, the former bootlegger Louis Rosenstiel and his wife Susan. I found out early in the marriage that my husband was bisexual. He was involved with Roy Cohn, the assistant counsel to Senator McCarthy. When he used to come with a little boyfriend and they used to like, uh, you know, uh, squeeze each other and uh, that I should really see that he was uh, a gay boy. So one day, Rowan Steele said, we're going to go this evening to the Plaza Hotel. And Roy Cohn was there. And he said, you'll be very much surprised at what you'll see. So I didn't have much to say. I said, all right, I'll go. When they arrived at the plaza, Rosenstiel insisted that they enter by a side door. We uh, went up into the uh, elevator. It was, we went to either the second or the third floor. There was a sign on the door where he led me to, not to disturb. And we knocked on the door, and Roy Cohn opened the door. And we went in, and there was... <laughs> there was... Uh, this gentleman, uh, he was dressed as a woman, and uh, Roy introduced me. He said, I'd like you to meet Mary. Well, I, uh, I knew uh, the name wasn't Mary because uh, he looked just like J. Edgar Hoover. In fact, he was uh, very solid looking, and uh, he had like a little uh, growth, and he was dressed in a black uh, chiffon uh, dress, very short with ruffles and a black lace uh, stockings and high heel shoes and a black curly wig and black false eyelashes. And he was sitting, he crossed his legs. Now, wait a minute. You, you're saying it looked like J. Edgar Hoover or it, it was clearly to you J. Edgar Hoover? It was clearly to me J. Edgar Hoover. Do you have any doubt at all about that? Absolutely not. According to Susan Rosenstiel, two young men arrived and first Hoover, then Cohn and Rosenstiel went into the bedroom and had sex with them. Once again, Hoover had allowed himself to be dangerously compromised. Additionally, in her interviews with Anthony Summers, Susan would continue. One day, I came into my husband's bedroom and found him in bed with Roy Cohn. It was about nine o'clock in the morning. I was shocked. He made some sort of joke about it being so he could be alone with his attorney. To which I replied, I've never seen Governor Dewey in bed with you because Dewey was one of his attorneys as well. And I walked out. Susan Kaufman has insisted she could not possibly have been mistaken that J. Edgar Hoover was definitely the man in the female dress at the Plaza Hotel. Her account has remained consistent and she signed a sworn affidavit claiming it is true. That she was permitted to witness Hoover and the others in such a situation she surmised because they wanted a woman present. I guess it gave them some sort of extra thrill. And if I'd said anything, they'd have said I was crazy, that Hoover hadn't been there. It would have been my word against theirs, and no one would have believed it. These allegations made by Susan Kaufman resulted in considerable efforts to discredit or silence her. Returning to Summers, Hoover defenders maintain that Susan Kaufman is not a credible source because in 1971, she pleaded guilty to an attempted perjury charge. I discuss this in the hardback edition of this book, and unlike those who now attack Susan, also explain the circumstances. The charge was brought in connection with a two-year-old civil suit, a move considered unprecedented and bizarre by lawyers. 
This was done the very week the New York State Legislative Committee on Crime had planned to produce Susan Kaufman as a witness to her husband's mafia links. Outraged, committee officials believed the charge was instigated by Louis Rosenstiel, using his wealth and influence to obstruct the committee's inquiry by discrediting his former wife. Court records show the tycoon had used similar tactics in the past in order to pervert the course of justice. Those trying to discredit Susan today claim that she was reputedly an alcoholic with mental problems, known as Snow White in unnamed circles. During six years' work on Official and Confidential, including extended interviews with the woman, I found no evidence to support such accusations, nor were any such weaknesses even rumored until after publication of my book. On the contrary, the former chief counsel of the Crime Committee, Edward McLaughlin, and committee investigator William Gallinero found Susan Kaufman an exceptionally good witness. I have now received FBI files on Louis Rosenstiel, files withheld during the years I worked on the book, in spite of an early application under the Freedom of Information Act. They contain nothing to discredit Susan Kaufman. Susan has also alleged that Hoover brought pressure on politicians to help further her husband's business interests, and the FBI files show that Rosen still did lobby the director's office about his business problems. Susan also mentioned that she had once possessed a photograph of Hoover in the company of her husband's mobster friends. That she did have such evidence was confirmed following publication of this book by Mary Nichols of the Philadelphia Inquirer, who met Susan Kaufman years ago. According to Nichols, she did have a suitcase of photographs that she had hauled away from her marriage to Louis Rosenstiel. The ones I saw showed Hoover, lawyer Roy Cohn, and Rosenstiel at all sorts of social events with mobsters. Susan's credibility aside, I ran her story not least because it was buttressed by similar accounts from two other witnesses. Moreover, in 1993, I learned that allegations about cross-dressing by Hoover were current in the East Coast gay community as early as 1963. Historically, Hoover's homosexuality matters because of the allegations that mafia bosses use their knowledge of his private life to blackmail him, thus incapacitating the FBI in the fight against organized crime. That the FBI was delinquent in this fight for most of Hoover's career is now beyond argument. In addition, tasked with investigating Roy Cohn for a case well after Kaufman's testimony, New York attorney John Klotz independently found evidence of the Blue Suite at the Plaza Hotel and its role in a sex extortion ring after coming through local government documents and information gathered by private detectives. It allegedly involved minors, as well as young men aged 18 and older. Klotz later summarized his findings, telling journalist and author Burton Hirsch, Roy Cohn was providing protection. There were a bunch of pedophiles involved. That's where Cohn got his power from. Blackmail. Further confirmation of Rosen Steele's and Cohn's activities in the Blue Suite, confirmed by Klotz to be Suite 233, comes from statements made by Cohn himself to former NYPD detective and ex-head of the department's Human Trafficking and Vice-Related Crimes Division, James Rothstein. Rothstein would tell John DeCamp, a former Nebraska state senator who investigated the Franklin scandal of the 1980s, that Cohn, during a sit-down interview with the former detective, admitted to being part of a sexual blackmail operation targeting politicians with minors. Reading from John DeCamp's The Franklin Cover-Up, Child Abuse, Satanism, and Murder in Nebraska, Gray's associate Wilson was apparently continuing the work of a reported collaborator of Gray from the 1950s, McCarthy Committee Counsel Roy Cohn, who has now died of AIDS. According to the former head of the Vice Squad for one of America's biggest cities, Cohn's job was to run the little boys. Say you have an admiral, a general, a congressman, who didn't want to go along with the program, Cohn's job was to set them up. Then they would go along. Cohn told me that himself. James Rothstein later told Paul David Collins, a former journalist turned researcher, that Cohn had also identified this sexual blackmail operation as being part of the anti-communist crusade of the time. The fact that Cohn, per Rothstein's recollection, stated that this sex blackmail ring was part of the anti-communist crusade, coupled with Hoover's involvement in these blue sweet events, suggests that elements of the government, including Hoover's FBI, may have been connected at a much broader level to the operation in a way that transcended Hoover's own personal involvement. Rothstein later confirmed his statements to both DeCamp and Collins in an interview with Whitney Webb that was conducted in early 2020. He additionally told Webb that Cohn had told him that his role in the ring had originally come about because he himself had been entrapped and blackmailed. Beyond debauchery, 
the parties at the Blue Suite more importantly served as an invaluable source of blackmail, and it would be Meyer Lansky who was credited with originally obtaining compromising photos of FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Meyer Lansky had uh, some pretty heavy stuff on Hoover, that he was a homosexual, without any question. And uh, he'd shove it to him if he, if, he, if he ever had to. Irving Resnick said Lansky was the guy who controlled the pictures and he had made his deal with Hoover to lay off. That was the reason that for a long time we had nothing to fear from the FBI. I heard Rosenstiel say that if Hoover ever brings pressure against Lansky or any of us, we'll use this as blackmail. We'll expose him. Reading from Jerome A. Croth, Conspiracy in Camelot, The Complete History of the Assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Hoover's homosexuality was common knowledge in the underworld. Frank Costello, Meyer Lansky, Jimmy the Weasel Fratiano, Frank Bonpensiero, and Carlos Michello all knew. Hoover was arrested in the 1920s on a homosexuality charge, and John Roselli, the West Coast representative of the mob, learned of it. According to Lansky's widow, Lansky obtained hard proof of Hoover's homosexuality and used it to neutralize the FBI as a threat to his own operations. These photos showed Hoover engaged in oral sex with his lifelong confidant and suspected lover, FBI Deputy Director Clyde Tolson. There is considerable evidence from the time corroborating the close professional relationship between Hoover and Tolson was also intimate and that the two were an open secret in Washington. One example was the way Hoover promoted a young agent, Clyde Tolson, to be his deputy in just two years. Tolson was also his best friend and the appointment smacked of favoritism. For the next 42 years, the two bachelors were constant companions. To the public, Hoover was a real-life hero. He and Clyde Tolson were treated like movie stars. The two snappily dressed bachelors were often seen in New York's most fashionable night spots. One of their favorite hangouts was the Stork Club, managed by Sherman Billingsley, who used to place illegal bets for them. It was here, one New Year's Eve, that Hoover and Tolson betrayed the secret they shared, a secret that could have destroyed Hoover's reputation and his career. Well, it was a wonderful night at the Stork Club. It was New Year's Eve, 1936, and I was the only woman at the table. Louisa Stewart, a famous model, and her boyfriend, Art Arthur, had been invited to join Hoover and Tolson at Walter Winchell's table. We all had on those crazy hats and the, the things you, you blew. And, and uh, at one point, I'm pointing a, a, a toy gun at Hoover, who has his hands up. And uh, it was just a, a, a great night. It was getting really late, and Hoover was rather annoyed with, with Clyde. He thought Clyde had had too much to drink. And finally, the decision was to go to the, the Cotton Club up in Harlem. We went in, in the FBI limousine, and uh, Art and I sat in the back seat, and Clyde and, and, and Jedgar, as we called him, sat in the two jump seats. And then I saw that they were holding hands. And I guess he was forgiving him, but I thought it was sort of odd. Without a love of my own. I remember the Cotton Club that night very well because there were a couple there who were black and white dancing together. And that made Hoover furious. And then Clyde, who was still pretty drunk, said, well, he'd like to dance with Hoover, which we all thought was very funny. Well, we left, finally. And in the taxi, going home. Then Art said to me, it's common knowledge that they're queer, that they're fairies. Those are the terms used in those days. But he said, we don't talk about it. Additionally, 
pulling from a 2011 article by Anthony Summers in The Guardian, Harry S. Truman, during his presidency, wrote in 1945, We want no Gestapo or secret police. FBI is tending in that direction. They are dabbling in sex life scandals and plain blackmail when they should be catching criminals. They also have a habit of sneering at local law enforcement officers. This must stop. Cooperation is what we must have. Harry Hay, founder of America's first gay rights group, remembered that on vacation in California, in a circle in which they didn't have people who weren't gay, the two were knotted together as lovers. Bill Clinton, in 1993, while mulling over who to appoint as FBI director, found the cross-dressing rumors to be hilarious. It's going to be hard, he grinned during his speech at a press function, to fill J. Edgar Hoover's pumps. A former bureau inspector and trusted associate named Jimmy Cochran said years later that Hoover, youthful at the time, had once asked him to deal with a serious problem. He had been arrested on sex charges involving a young man during a trip to New Orleans. Cochran, who had powerful contacts in the state, said he intervened to hush the matter up. There is, too, a claim that as late as 1969, when Hoover was in his early 70s, he dallied with teenage boys during his habitual summer trip in California. An element of corroboration to this claim comes from Don Smith, an officer on the Los Angeles Police Vice Squad, who told me of interviews he conducted with young people during a pedophile investigation. The kids brought up several famous names, including those of Hoover and his sidekick. For Summers, the most significant credible information on Hoover's sexuality came with the discovery that Hoover consulted Marshall de Gruffin, a Washington psychiatrist. Whether we like it or not, um, it's always been true that a public man's private sex life makes him vulnerable. Hoover knew this. Uh, he would eventually seek out uh, one of the most distinguished psychiatrists in Washington um, to ask for advice and help because he was so terrorized by his own sexuality. What was he as direct director of the FBI to do about these urges that he had? In Las Vegas, Hoover's homosexuality was more than a matter of gossip. In the casinos, the wise guys talked about how it gave the mafia a hold over him. Irving Resnick, who was the Las Vegas representative of the big New England mob family, um, said in, in 1971 that Lansky was the one who had, quote, nailed J. Edgar Hoover. I remember Rash Resnick at the Caesars Palace. He used to be the manager of the nightclub there. He told me that uh, Maya Lansky had some pretty strong evidence that uh, Hoover and Tolson uh, were both homosexuals. When he was asked what that meant, he said that Lansky had obtained um, photographs of Hoover in a compromising situation with, with Clyde Tolson. At some point, these alleged photos of Hoover and Clyde Tolson fell into the hands of CIA counterintelligence chief James Angleton. During his time at the agency, Angleton was in charge of cultivating the CIA's relationship with the FBI and Israeli intelligence a group that will play increasingly major roles as we get closer to the rise of Jeffrey Epstein. He also had deep ties to the OSS X2 Vienna branch, the counterintelligence unit that birthed many of the players of the Burma-China-India opium trade, discussed in Chapter 1. Angleton would allegedly show these photos to several other CIA officials, including John Weitz and Gordon Novell. One man who actually claims to have seen such photographs is Gordon Novell, a controversial figure with connections to the intelligence community. Novell, who had worked for the White House in the early 1960s, became involved in a complicated legal action which the White House wanted him to pursue, but which Hoover wanted dropped. So I went to the White House, and the White House sent me to Mr. Angleton, Director of Counterintelligence, CIA. We met in a restaurant. And I told him my problem, and he says, I know what your problem is. He said, you need to tell Mr. Hoover that you've met with me and uh, that you're not going to dismiss the lawsuit and that you've seen this. At which point he opened up his briefcase and pulled out a couple of photographs of, uh, of Mr. Hoover in flagrante delicto, I guess is one way to describe it. Having oral sex. This testimony does not stand alone. 
uh, I talked to a former regular officer in the OSS, that's the predecessor of the CIA, um, who said that after the war, um, he went to dinner with other OSS American intelligence colleagues, and that after dinner, when over the brandy stage, when conversation turned to um, the private lives of, of public people, um, his host went out of the room and then came back with a photograph. And this was passed around the table, and the photograph um, showed two men, Hoover and Tolson, um, engaged in homosexual activity. In New Orleans, where the CIA and the Mafia had sometimes collaborated, Mafia Don Carlos Marcelo told Gordon Novell that he too had seen a photograph. I had volunteered the information that I had seen a picture of uh, uh, Mr. Hoover in performing oral sex, and he said that he had seen it too, and that had been used to keep the uh, FBI, but not the Justice Department, off the back of the mob. With Angleton dead, there is no way to follow up this bizarre allegation. While Novell is a controversial figure, his account of seeing compromising pictures must be considered, especially in light of other such references, not least of which being that of former OSS officer John Weitz, who has since identified the host of his dinner party as James Angleton. Summers speculates it is possible that the pictures had been taken at the behest of OSS veteran William Donovan during his feud with OSS Chief William Donovan, dating back to 1941, J. Edgar Hoover had searched for compromising information, sexual lapses included, that could be used against his rival. His effort was in vain, but Donovan reportedly retaliated in kind, ordering a secret investigation of Hoover's relationship with Clyde Tolson. Given the history and collaboration between O&I, the OSS, and organized crime figures, Meyer Lansky being chief among them, it's not far-fetched to believe the pictures were taken on Donovan's behalf and subsequently ended up in the hands of OSS and CIA veterans. With Rosen Steele's mobster associates being under significantly more pressure during the 1950s, in large part thanks to the Kefauver Committee, it's possible that Hoover's appearance at the Plaza Hotel may have served as additional insurance for those interests. Hoover, for his part, was likely already used to the realities of being blackmailed by this point, given that his private sex life had been known to the mob and the U.S. intelligence community for years. He likely saw the opportunity to partake in the scheme as a means of amassing his own massive collection of blackmail. With thick dossiers on friend and foe alike, Hoover's office contains secret files on numerous powerful people in Washington and beyond. Files he used to gain favors and protect his status as FBI director for as long as he wished. Even former OSS veterans like Richard Helms have made such claims, alleging that Hoover played a very skillful game with knowledge of the sexual habits of prominent people. Further evidence can be garnered from journalist and author Burton Hirsch, reading from his book Bobby and J. Edgar, the historic face-off between the Kennedys and J. Edgar Hoover that transformed America, Professor Ethan Theo Harris dwells on the ferocity with which the director had his cohorts bully rag the aristocratic Richmond-bred CIA officer Joseph Bryan III in 1952 when Bryan told guests at a dinner party that Hoover had a crush on a friend of theirs and had made advances to him several times. Outraged, Hoover ordered that Bryan be made to put up or shut up. I want no effort to be spared to call his bluff and promptly. After many threats and counter threats, Brian recanted and the matter died. Every effort was initiated immediately after to discredit all charges. These disinformation efforts survived Hoover. A summary of KGB files by Christopher Andrew and Vasily Mitralkin would have it that all those cross-dressing rumors originated with the KGB's Service A in Moscow. Despite efforts at every level to explain away the scandalous stories, enough kept breaking loose to suggest that Summers was onto something. A feature by Murray Weiss in the New York Post on February 11, 1993, documents the 1966 probe of an extortion ring by Manhattan District Attorney Frank Hogan's racket squad. The Chicken and the Bulls, as the extortionists called themselves, sent young men into hotel and airport bars to proposition distinguished-looking male visitors and lead them to hotel rooms. Other members of the gang would then burst in, posing as police detectives, and shake the victims down. The gang entrapped a wide range of educators and entertainers, as well as a lot of military brass. One admiral, William Church, would later kill himself rather than risk the disclosure of this blackmail. 
This ring was organized by Sherman Kaminsky and Edward Murphy. A photo turned up of Hoover himself posing amiably with Kaminsky, while Clyde Tolson had reportedly fallen victim to the extortion ring. At some point, the FBI jumped into the investigation. Hoover's picture disappeared from the files, and Kaminsky went underground, fleeing prosecution on the New York State extortion charges and subsisting for 11 years in Denver, raising rabbits and distributing wigs. There are few possibilities as to why Hoover would be involved with the activities of Kaminsky. One possibility is that Hoover himself had been blackmailed by Kaminsky, though it's more likely that Kaminsky instead had ties to figures in organized crime, and these figures had already blackmailed Hoover long before. Another possibility is that Hoover was cozy to a second sexual blackmail operation targeting closeted homosexual men because he sought to pad his own library of blackmail for personal and professional gain. What does seem clear is that Hoover was well aware of the power that amassing blackmail afforded, and he was willing to indulge in taboo behavior at the Blue Suite because he was no longer concerned about being extorted or manipulated with sexual blackmail in ways that would end his career or destroy his personal life. He had fallen in with the very crowd that had reportedly blackmailed him, later developing a symbiotic relationship with that same network. The most obvious and troubling symptom of this symbiosis was Hoover's reluctance to tackle organized crime as FBI director. Hoover reportedly declined to use the Bureau to target organized crime networks, referring to organized crime as a local problem in which the FBI did not need to intervene for most of his nearly 50-year stint as the top law enforcement administrator in the country, according to congressional crime consultant Ralph Salerno. I think if they could have been attacked before they grew, before they got the wealth, before they got the knowledge, organized crime could have been nipped in the bud, if you will, uh, and never would have grown as strong as it got to be uh, in later decades. Other aspects of Hoover's symbiotic relationship with these organized crime-tinged networks can also be seen in Hoover's ties to Rosenstiel and Rosenstiel's close associate, Roy Cohn, in the above-board worlds of legitimate business and politics. The Blue Sweet parties and blackmail may also explain the uncharacteristic ease with which a young Roy Cohn was able to meet with J. Edgar Hoover upon his arrival as a young man in Washington, D.C. in 1952, an event that has puzzled Cohn's biographers. Reading from Cohn biographer Nicholas von Hoffman's Citizen Cohn, in later years, Roy told an involuted story about how he forced his way upward through the FBI bureaucracy to talk to the already legendary J. Edgar Hoover about a presentment. The grand jury wanted to file a presentment, but the Department of Justice was trying to block it, and I was siding with the grand jury. The department was putting pressure on me to kill the presentment because they thought it would hurt the administration in the forthcoming election. I'm a Democrat, but I didn't feel it would hurt anyone at all. When I tried to arrange an appointment through channels, I got absolutely no place, except reported back to my superiors in the Justice Department, who were all the more angry with me. Just as I was leaving my office in Washington one day, the phone rang, and when I picked it up, a woman said, Mr. Cohn, Mr. Hoover is calling. Hoover came on the line and said, Roy, are you trying to see me? To which I replied, you're darn right I'm trying to see you. It's been rather difficult. Hoover then said, whenever you want to see me, you just pick up the phone and ask for me, and you'll be able to see me. To which I replied, well, when can I see you? And he said, come on over. Within 10 minutes, I was seated across the desk from him. He told me in the course of that conversation to go right ahead, to stick to my guns and do what I thought was the right thing to do. If they fired me on account of it, let them do it. The Truman administration, he said, was on its last legs. And if they fire you, they'll make a hero out of you and I will publicly back you up. Here was I in my mid-twenties, apparently engaged in a knockdown, drag-out fight with the heads of the Justice Department as to whether I would be allowed access to the director. I also felt alone. I literally did not have a friend in the Justice Department. I do not make friends easily, and I am not the kind of guy who goes out to lunch with the boys and spends a couple of hours talking about last night's date. However, Cohn did have friends in the Justice Department, and while Roy's version of how he met the director is not directly contradicted, it seems improbable. By this time, he was George Sikorsky's protege, and Sikorsky was a friend in frequent contact with Hoover. Given Roy's already oft used way of getting places by going through friends, why would he choose to swim up the waterfalls of bureaucracy when he didn't have to? Roy liked to cast himself in the role of the lonely one, of the kid making his way through the world. 
The right-wing style of speech from that time to this frequently starts with the presumption that institutional power is arrayed against the narrative's hero. This may have influenced Roy's account, or it may have been the transference of the emotions and feelings of a closeted homosexual during a period when it could well seem that the world was in fact against him. Roy's account of what Hoover told him is a story that somebody with a dangerous secret to hide might tell. According to Roy, the FBI director instructed him that when you want to see me, call me directly. Don't go through channels. This Justice Department is the biggest gossip mill in Washington. The gossips there are worse than the perverts at the CIA. They're monitoring your phone calls at your own office across the way. And you no sooner picked up the phone for this appointment than your boss was on the phone with us warning that you are an insubordinate troublemaker and that I shouldn't see you. This account is at odds with J. Edgar Hoover's reputation as one of the most adept of mountain goats in negotiating the trails and passes of the federal bureaucracy. Would such a man be so compromisingly frank with a junior whom he had only recently met, even if that junior came with a recommendation from George Sikorsky? Would merely sharing a political outlook on the dangers of communism be enough to seduce Hoover, who was never indiscreet into such indiscretions as advising Roy, all else failing, to threaten to quit and back it up by calling a press conference if there were no other way to shake the presentment loose? Some of Roy's unlikely stories do turn out to be true, but a life pattern of wily moves argues against Hoover's intriguing in a way that could easily be traced back to him. A few years later, Hoover apparently did render Roy invaluable help in staying out of jail, but it was done obliquely, through third parties. However, in the context of the Blue Sweet parties at the Plaza Hotel, it's certainly possible that both Cohn's account of his first official meeting with Hoover and his harboring of a dangerous secret are both true. This is supported from press reports of the same period that claim, soon after Cohn caught Hoover's eye in Washington, D.C., Hoover showered Cohn with compliments and notes and photographs. Burton Hirsch similarly asserts that soon after meeting, Hoover and Cohn traded favors, effusive compliments, gifts, and elaborate private dinners. It quickly became Roy and Edgar. The official story also holds that the only bond initially shared between Rosenstiel and Cohn, as it is alleged with Hoover and Cohn, was a shared commitment to anti-communism, which has similarly left biographers and observers of their relationship puzzled by improbable anecdotes similar to those just described. Yet, in an era where the Red Scare raged alongside the so-called Lavender Scare, which targeted homosexuals with the same fervor as the Red Scare targeted communists, the bonds forged between a group of men who shared their forbidden passions in a web of secretive orgies, blackmail, and organized crime would have fostered a much stronger sense of camaraderie. The surprising closeness shared by Rosenstiel, Cohn, and Hoover can be seen in other arrangements. For instance, soon after meeting Hoover officially for the first time in 1956, Hoover sent Rosenstiel flowers when Rosenstiel fell ill. A year later, Rosenstiel was heard telling Hoover, your wish is my command, during a meeting. That same year, Louis Nichols, Hoover's number two at the Bureau for decades, was hired to become executive vice president of Rosenstiel's Shenley Empire. Around this time, it was reported that Rosenstiel had bought large quantities of books about Hoover and distributed them as gifts. In addition, Rosenstiel had also bought no less than 25,000 copies of Masters of Deceit, a book written by Hoover about how to fight communism in the United States, which he then sent to schools around the country. A few years later, in 1965, Nichols incorporated the J. Edgar Hoover Foundation. Rosenstiel was the principal contributor, giving the foundation 1,000 shares of Shenley stock. Nichols also gave a smaller but unknown amount of Shenley shares to the foundation, while the American Jewish League Against Communism, of which Roy Cohn was now president, gave $500 to help start the foundation. A year later, the Dorothy H. and Louis Rosenstiel Foundation gave $50,000 to the foundation. Then, in 1968, the Rosenstiel Foundation gave an additional $1 million to the Hoover Foundation, which was made in the form of bonds of the Glen Alden Corporation, which took over Shenley Industries that same year. A 1969 report in the Washington Post later noted that nearly everyone directly associated with Nichols in the Hoover Foundation is or was connected with either the FBI or the Shenley Empire. The report also noted that despite lofty promises regarding the foundation's activities, it spent hardly any money at the time the Washington Post report was published in 1969. 
suggesting that something about the Foundation's activities at the time were odd. It was around this same period that Rosenstiel began to retire, selling his controlling interest to Glenn Alden in 1968 and resigning as chairman and CEO of Shenley. While it seemed that Cohn would serve as Rosenstiel's successor in matters of blackmail, it seems another man served as his successor in matters of business. Per Rosenstiel's New York Times obituary, around the time he sold his control of Shenley to Glenn Alden, he also sold his Manhattan townhouse, which was bugged for blackmail, to Israeli-American businessman Meshulam Rickless. Rickless was then an influential figure at Glenn Alden, whose rise had been regarded with skepticism by Wall Street and the press. Indeed, Rickless had absorbed so many companies, including Glenn Alden and Shenley, in 1972 into his Rapid American Corporation that he was forced to defend himself publicly, insisting that the fuel for his corporate takeovers involved no mystery money, no unnamed associates, and no Swiss bank money. And that takes us to the end of Chapter 2. In summary, Sam Brofman led his family to wealth and influence by taking advantage of prohibition and the subsequent black market. His one-time middleman and future rival, Louis Rosenstiel, was also a powerful figure with ties to organized crime and political elites. This put him at the center of a power dynamic between the FBI and organized crime. It was through Rosenstiel that Meyer Lansky could have potentially got the opportunity to take alleged photos of FBI founder and director J. Edgar Hoover, allowing organized crime a blackmail opportunity that would explain the FBI's virtual blind eye towards their activities. This web serves as another example of criminal elements, intelligence agencies, and political elites melding together and engaging in nefarious activities, sexual blackmail and pedophilia being at the top of the list. We'll be diving deeper into these characters in future episodes. Their roles and ties to the rise of Jeffrey Epstein will become more clear as we continue the journey through the lies, deceit, and depravity. As always, thanks to everyone for joining me. If you like the information being shared here, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share the video. Also, be sure to check out Whitney Webb's work. Support her by buying One Nation Under Blackmail. Links in the description. Looking forward to seeing y'all for Chapter 3. Peace.